Hey, there we go. <laughs> it's very rare that I get to talk about these kind of movies in the daytime. Um, so I'm just going to address this really, really quickly. I know a couple people have been asking when the next vaulting is up, and it's sadly still being worked on. Um, I can't promise a due date anytime soon, because normally when I do, it's really sort of like a crapshoot in a sense. Like, oh, um, the estimates, blah, 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 will be so-and-so. Uh, when it comes out, it will come out. That's probably the best way I can put it. Um, progress is being made. I wouldn't worry too much about it. In terms of completion, I'd say 75% at the moment. Um, that's probably the best I can recollect. And um, on the other side, there's uh, something else that's been going on. Oh, hold on a second. There. So as I was saying, um, there's something else that's been also going on too. Um, aside from my job in retail, I'm making front headlines now. Look at that beauty right there. Oh, there we go. See, look at that. I'm right there. I'm making front page. So yeah, I've been I've been working for a local newspaper since uh, February. Um, it's been really interesting. I've been attending a lot of uh, meetings and um, social events as well. And, and it's been very fun. It's been very interesting getting into the, the world of journalism uh, and also writing as well, uh, reporting on news and debating on what to talk about and what to discuss. And that's been doing pretty well. And it's, it's very busy. It's very, very busy. You have to go into these meetings and have a full understanding of what's being talked about and what to discuss, so um, that's what keeps me pretty busy. Uh, but I wouldn't say that marks the end of the show. I've already shot a second episode. Um, in fact, I think about 80% of that has been completed. There's just some little pickups need to do and some green screen work they need to film. Uh, but of course, when the time comes, I'll definitely uh, put focus on that when I have like a day off, which you know might be tomorrow, or it could be. Uh, so, there you go. There's two vaulting episodes right there. There's one that's still being worked on by a good friend of mine, and a second one that is currently being filmed, so when those two come out, they will come out. I, I can guarantee that. Um, but on the bright side, I'm still doing these Cinevlogs because I really don't want to say this because they're easy to do. And I like to talk about movies. I have a huge passion for them. Um, I really want to talk about modern stuff as well. And that's why I, I just keep doing these kinds of videos, because I just like talking about films. I don't want to let that passion and fury die. It's something that really is a huge part of me. Um, but if you if you don't like the Cineblogs, fine, all the power to you. But um, there are ways to know that I'm still here. I, I don't want to leave you with nothing. That's the thing. I really don't like leaving people empty-handed. Um, so even if it's not something you expected to see, at least at the very most, um, here I am doing these videos because that's what I like doing. That's really what I like doing. I really like talking about movies and just making these kinds of videos. And it's the least of what I can do. Uh, also, there's a novel I wrote. You can find it on inkkit.com slash moviebookfilm90. There's probably like links and stuff on the bottom or at the end of the video like I normally do. Um, so enough jib-jab. Uh, let me get to the real meat of the story. I have been trying to catch my summer movies, and here it is. Hearts of the Caribbean 5. Johnny Depp needs a paycheck. <laughs> Which is quite essentially what this is. Um, let me tell you, revisiting these pirate movies, with the exception of the fourth one, because we're... Oh, hey, Bella. <laughs> nice to see you're here. Yeah, you've been doing well. You certainly have been. Thick as thieves. Thick as thieves. Quasi poos, quasi poos. Um, in regards to these pirate movies, it's a franchise that, you know, arguably has been pretty well um, here and overseas, but over time it's become one of those franchises where maybe they should let it go, maybe they should just let it be... Um, I really don't see any continuing value, especially after what they did with the third one. Okay, so let me put my general concessions here on these films. Um, the first one's good. It, it's great. It's not a masterpiece, but at the same time, it's entertaining. It is what it is. Um, it's a little lengthy in spots, especially for a two and a near half hour film. Um, but it's fun. I remember seeing it first at the drive-ins when they paired it with Finding Nemo, and let me tell you, that was actually a perfect pairing. Um, and there was Dead Man's Chest, which 
still holds up, but it does have some problems, especially in the story. It's pretty much just like one action set piece after another linked together with this whole plot about Jack trying to make amends with this debt he has and blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. And that's when the series started derailing because they felt, okay, we need to make this like big and epic and grand. And that was the thing. It was Pirates of the Caribbean. It didn't need to be like big and grand. It was very simplistic. The only thing that made it big and grand was the swashbuckling action and the explosions and, you know, the fight scenes and everything. And when it delivers it, Dead Man's Chest really delivered it. The third one is trying to be more of a character story um, at World's End. And I think that's where it fails the most because there's not too many action sequences in that one. There's the first one there, they're doing the escape in China, and that's bookended with these two ships duking out with each other on this giant toilet swirly cyclone thingy. Um, I know what it is. It's called a mouse storm, and it's being controlled by a voodoo witch doctor, which was in love with Davy Jones, but they don't love each other, so now Calypso is going against everyone. You see what I mean here? That's the problem with the second one and the third one. They try to make this a grand epic story by adding so many rules and so many plot lines that it becomes so contrived of itself. You kind of think to yourself, well, could they just limit it to, like, a couple of basic things here and there? Um, like, even in Gremlins, they had, like, three basic rules, you know? Never feed after midnight, don't get it wet, don't put it in sunlight. And while they had a lot of plot holes, that was kind of the fun of it. Because you could easily make fun of how simplistic it is, but enjoy how, you know, innocent it is. Uh, fourth one... It's not as memorable as the other two. I remember that one pretty well for, um, the mermaids and the fact that it's the Fountain of Youth. Those are really the only two things that stand out for you the most. The, the rest of the stuff, nah. Um, so here we have the fifth one, and I remember hearing a lot of news about it, and it was coming in at a bad time, um, with Johnny Depp and, you know, how his stardom was going, and when I came out of this movie, the first thing that came to my mind was had this movie come out maybe five or three years from now, if it came out, you know, prior, um, if, 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 if this came out three or four years ago, it could have been passable. I don't think it would have been, like, maybe... Um, it, it probably would have been passable. Like, about as, about as successful as the fourth one. Um, but looking at it now, it's a really strange math problem. It's doing really well overseas. It's got, like, over $300 million, especially with the budget it has. And yet over here, it kind of sort of tanked. It got 111 million as of this um, video so far, so it's really hard to judge the success of this film, um, especially when you, when you really boil down to it. It's just fine. It's supposed, it's trying to be this very serviceable blockbuster. Um, when you compare it to the first three films, it's really Gore Verbinski light, because obviously Gore Verbinski is you know, not directing these films. Um, and so because of that, I think this franchise really lost its great, you know, strong support pull, because at least Verbinski could really know how to take the, the dark uh, elements and make it so comedic and light. And here, they're trying to still emulate that. And it feels like it's a clone, in a sense. Uh, it, it follows the same beat-by-beat beat elements, and it just tries to stick with it. And yet it falls apart because it feels like a pale imitation. Because it's been a while since the first movie. I mean, the first one came out, like, what, 2001? Or, or 2002? Maybe, maybe it was 2002. 2001 or 2002, one of the two. Um, no, 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 it was 2003. That It was 2003, that's what it was. Um, it's been a long time. These films have come, like, a really long time, and so we get to this point here, and everything feels so tired and, you know, exhausted. It's like there's nothing else you can really go with here. Okay, so apparently there's this evil pirate... No, sorry, not a pirate, sorry. Uh, the, this, this Spanish captain, played by the villain from Skyfall, um, Captain Salazar, 
is a ghost, and apparently Jack did something to him in the past, and now he's out for revenge, and in a minor league complex way, which is kind of confusing and weird, um... Because of Jack's bond with this compass that he has throughout the entire franchise, he, you know, gives her up in the most stupid way possible, just for a bottle of rum. And because of that, there's this weird th mystical thingy where, oh, if you betray the, the compass, you know, bad things will happen to you and you'll be cursed or something. Um, and so... Somehow it frees the the ghost captain, and he's after him. And on the long the way, he's killing like pirate ships and stuff. And to be fair, it's a very interesting concept. His crew is pretty much all burnt and stuff. And so as they walk around in ghost form, there's like hands and stuff flying around. Some of the pirates are like you know missing heads and stuff. So they kind of look like smashed porcelain dolls. Um, it's kind of like if Salvador Dali did. A pirate movie. That's probably the best way to put it. There's like mouths and stuff flying around, which is kind of cool. And, and, and even though it's a little strange, especially considering how um, Salazar's hair keeps floating around, stuff like he's underwater. Um, it's weird, but it's interesting. It it, it it doesn't have much of a well, yeah. There is kind of a payoff of it in the, in the near the end, but it's very subtle. And it's not like you know, ha ha, you know, we we tie this together. And it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's going on, and meanwhile, well, not much of a spoiler because we already know about this, I guess. But spoiler alert. Um, on top of that, we have the son of Will Turner, Henry, who's trying to lift, you know, his dad's curse because he's bound the Flying Dutchman. Um, and so he thinks that Jack Sparrow has a way to figure this out. And there's also this girl that's tossed into the mix that knows astronomy and everybody keeps saying she's a witch because she can read the stars and stuff, which it kind of sort of works in that time period, but at the same time it's, it's a very tired running gag when you have someone that knows all this knowledge and they keep saying, oh, she's a witch because, you know, she, a man, you know, blah, 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 blah. It's like, really? Give it a rest. Um, the old crew is back. Uh, Gibbs is there. Barbosa is there, which is weird because Barbosa is, like, living the ultimate lifestyle. <laughs> he's on this, like, Las Vegas kind of pirate ship with all this treasure around him, which is kind of cool, and he's eating these jelly baby like candies with chopsticks. <laughs> Which, which is actually kind of a funny image, because that's, like, the the way everybody wants to live their pirate life. Um, but then, when the movie gets into complex territory with the story, it's a shame, because for a two-hour running time, there are certain things that, are, that could be played out so simplistic that you could just cut certain things out here and there, and it just would have been fine. This whole story is really just trying to lift a curse, even though it's not really there. Um, there's just really no point to anything that goes on. Uh, okay, so the the astronomer girl can read the stars, and apparently they're trying to find um, Poseidon's trident, which will, you know, remove all curses and stuff. And um, apparently she knows how to, you know, the directions and you know, map stars and stuff. And for something that sounds so simple, it's a very... They try to make this very difficult journey when it's so easy to come across, especially for a two-hour film. Um, they're, they're just on the seas, they bicker and argue, they go on an island, and there's all these people there that force Jack into a shotgun wedding at one point. Um, and that's really the major problem with this whole movie. Even when they try to make it, you know, complex in the smallest ways possible, Nothing sticks because there is no ticking time. There is no um, anchor to set everything in place. Everyone can just, you know, wander around. There, there's no risk at play is what I'm saying. <laughs> like, you can have Salazar, like, you know, kill crew members and stuff, and, and it won't even matter. You can just, like, r you know, ram a ship over things and everything, and... Nothing really matters. There's no sense of care. Even when they do these big action sequences, they only seem, you know, awake enough 
because they really want this stunt to go well and have these things pay off and stuff. But when they're sitting and talking and trying to get the story move along through verbal dialogue, there really isn't a sense of care. Um, a prime example, and I don't mean to beat around the bush, but Johnny Depp. Um, if you've seen him in the previous part of movies, with the exception of the fourth one, he always seemed like he was really into this, you know, this character he made, Captain Jack Sparrow, which was a success by accident. Um, and there was always this sense where he does seem a little out of it and kind of like, oh, the rumbo, I don't know, think of this, anything. And even though he doesn't make a whole lot of sense, the payoff with the character is that even if he rambles on, there is that part of him that seems like somewhat of a secret genius, in a sense. Um, you always feel like he knows what's happening even if the audience doesn't know what's going on, and that's kind of a problem because we've seen this for the past, like, couple of films. And so when you catch on to a character's trademarks and bits, it's like, oh, oh he's going to do this, he's going to do this, I know, because in the previous movies he's done this. And that not only makes the character a little stale, but it doesn't help when your actor just doesn't feel like he's into it that much. There's scenes where he's sort of like sleepwalking and talking, or he's like, oh, I'm just going to, you know, do my little thing here and say lines, because, you know, I'm getting money for this, uh, it's... You know, it's the next pirate movie, ha <laughs> you know, everyone loves, you know, Jack Sparrow, and that's really what it feels like most of the time. Um, the only times when I didn't get that feeling was when they were doing these big action sequences, like the beginning one where they're robbing a bank, and, and they, they tie these horses to this safe, and instead of taking the safe with them, they take the whole building with them, which is actually kind of fun, um, if it didn't have its set of problems. So, pretend this is the bank and these are the horses, and they're pulling the bank throughout the entire street. Now, you would think they'd be pulling this bank um, through a town that has, like, you know, different turns and curves and stuff, because that would add a lot of risks to it. No, it doesn't. Um, the only risk is a bridge, and that's about it. Uh, most of the time, this bank is just going plowing straight through, and there's no obstacles in their way, aside from maybe one or two buildings, that's about it. Um, but there's no sense of danger. There's no sense of, look out, a fork in the road, we have to, you know, turn it into... They don't do that. This thing is just going straight through a village. And it's only doing, like, maybe minor to slightly mildly damage. Um, there, there's a, a really interesting sequence where they're going to kill Captain Jack, where they're going to kill uh, Jack off and execute him via guillotine, and it does lead to a very interesting sequence with the guillotine itself that's actually kind of fun, when all this other stuff is going on, um, and it does lead to a pretty funny joke where he's about to be executed with the the girl, the, the astronomer girl, and they have like this little back and forth Bugs Bunny kind of chit chat as they're trying to edge on which one should go before the other, which was actually kind of funny. Um, but other than that, the, the rest of the movie, it just felt like everyone was there just doing their thing. It was really just them sitting around and standing and saying, okay, we're just going to do this because, you know what, it's Pirates of the Caribbean. No one really cares much about this franchise, so why should we care? And if they don't care about what they're doing in this movie, then why should we, the audience, even care? Not a whole lot of what they do really impacts much. So when we get to that big finale where it's the Ten Commandments and they split the sea and just to get this little thing and have the, like, the little big battle and stuff, it's not really that exciting. It really didn't feel that... You know, there wasn't this big push of momentum to, to earn like this big thing. It just feels like a really small scale climax. Um, it's about as exciting as the fight scene at the end of Stephen Summers' The Mummy only if they sucked the energy out, which is really hard to imagine. No, 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 B bad, bad comparison. Let me, let me put it this way. It's a, it, it's kind of like the ending to The Mummy Returns, where there's all this stuff going on, and they're trying to make it big and epic, and yet, if you cut one or two things out, it wouldn't feel like a grand climax. Like, in The Mummy Returns, there's so much going on. There's this huge battle, there's uh, Brendan Fraser's character going up against Imhotep, there's this cat fight going on with his wife and Imhotep's girlfriend, um, and the Scorpion King comes out, and oh, I'm going to tear him up even though I'm a crappy CGI Dwayne Johnson. You know, as 
as convoluted and overly done as that climax is, at least there was stuff going on. And I could remember those things. Um, here, all I just remember is they're under the sea and it's split, and Salazar's using the trident to beat Jack up by throwing him in the water, whatever. Um, it really didn't feel like that big of a push, especially compared to everything else. And that's primarily because I don't know if this is the way the movie was written, or the way it was constructed, or who's performing in it. But there's nothing that really pushed it to say, Haha, take this, you know, this is actually better than the other ones. It was like, okay, this is interesting. Like, some of these things read on paper. I almost feel like this movie was made just to rectify the problems that existed in the previous films. I think it's because the reason why they made this film... Not just because it was a cash grab, I mean, it, it, it's technically a, a cash grab when you think about it, but I feel like they're only riding this on two big things. The nostalgia of the franchise and the stuff fans were angered about. It's like, okay, you didn't like the way that Ed's World, Ed, Ed's World ended. Well, spoiler alert, we're going to rectify that. We're going to have like the son of Will Turner go out and try to fix the curse, and... We're going to have all this other stuff come into play to make your super fun happy ending. So that way Captain Jack can get his crew and he doesn't get marooned again. Even though that was always the funny running joke. Um, we're going to have this little nice reunion and it'll be great. And it's just like, eh, eh. Like, you ex... Again, spoiler alert. You expect me to believe this certain character was on this island for all those years, waiting for Will Turner to return. I'm sorry, bullshit. Unless there's a certain scene, unless there's a certain scene that they had but cut out, that explains, you know, uh, Henry Turner being there and um, his mother, you know, waiting for them and stuff, because there were glimpses in the back when we see, like, this lighthouse kind of emporium, elaborate on that. You know, it could probably take like a minute or so. Um, I feel like their big fear is that they don't want to fall into the trap of the other pirate films and they're kind of trying to listen to criticisms and stuff and say, okay, we'll take those and, you know, make a better film. And they did. They definitely tried to rectify those faults, but they sacrificed the fun of it all. There's some great setups and some great ideas for things. But what falls it apart is that they're literally just sleepwalking through and just doing these things and saying, all right, we'll just toss a couple of things in there and they'll keep you guys awake. We'll put in, like, zombie sharks or something. Um, but even that scene kind of goes nowhere. That lasts, like, maybe a minute or two. And even, like I said, there's no greater risk at play. There's no sense of characters that have this morality play. Even when they sacrifice a character off, you just sort of sit there and go... All right, that just happened. They'll probably be back when they do number six. <laughs> Doesn't really matter. Oh well. Can't say I haven't seen that before. Um, but this is definitely not a movie to go home and be angry about. This is not the kind where it's like, oh, I'm gonna rant because it's horrible. It's like, it's fine. It's a serviceable two hours, but it's not the kind I would really recommend. Like, if you had two hours to kill and just needed something to have, that had, like, a couple of action sequences and stuff, um, that's really the only way I can recommend it. And the other thing that's sort of writing against it is that we've come so far into this decade, and there's been so many brand new things coming out. <laughs> Excuse me. Because there's so many brand new things coming out with uh, the superhero a the era of superheroes, and you know the the strange concepts and all, it makes you wonder where does something like this have, have a play in you know today's you know we want movies like these kind of things. Um, if there's a way to make a pirate movie in today's age, it's possible. And when I mean pirate movie, I don't mean Disney's Pirates of the Caribbean. I mean, a legit, straightforward pirate movie with swashbuckling fun and no supernatural curses and stuff like that. It can be done. It's just if the interest and time is there and if there's a good story to put behind it. And I'm trying to... It, it, the problem is I'm trying to think of a movie that is like that. Um, 
But the only ones I can think of are the ones from, like, the 40s and the 50s. You know, the swashbuckling B-movie kind of things. And it'd be nice to see another thing like that, but unfortunately today, this seems to be the only thing that we're going to get if we say we want a pirate movie. Oh, you want more of Johnny Depp doing this? Oh, with his little fingers and stuff. You want more silly shenanigans and more complex plot? It's like... This is the fifth movie. You've got to do something different, please. And if they ever do a sex one... After seeing what they did in the post-credit, there is a post-credit, there always is with these things. Um, if they ever do a 6-1, and if they go in the direction I think it's gonna go, I really don't believe there's any other thing you can do with this franchise. I really don't. Um, oh, uh, we can make like 16 Transformers movies. Um, ugh. Find something new! Do something different! There, there has to be something out there that's at least interesting unique. We're getting, like... Uh, we already had Wonder Woman, and that was... Uh, uh, wasn't groundbreaking, but it was enjoyable, it was entertaining, it was something different, and something, you know, really engaging. It was something that I really thought was, you know, well-earned of saying a good summer blockbuster movie, because it was fun, it was energetic. And you stayed awake most of the time. Um, this one, everyone feels so asleep during certain sections of this movie. I really can't seem to find where the fun factor is. I, I barely can remember someone that was giving it their all throughout the entire film. And once in a while they introduce a concept that kind of sort of goes somewhere but really doesn't. Um, there's a witch doctor. Oh, okay, let me let me rag on this one. So they rag on one of the characters for being a witch because she knows the stars, and yet they have a witch in their service. How does that even work? And even then, this character is only in like what two scenes. She 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 looks like um, Furiosa from Mad Max Fury, only with like little tick marks and stuff to make her look like weird and eccentric. And yet they don't do anything with her character. She's just, like, bubbling itself and spouts out exposition and everything. And if you just cut that character out, it wouldn't have mattered. That is the basic problem with this film. It's just literally chucking things at the dartboard and seeing what sticks. And yet nothing hits bullseye. There's maybe one or two things that come close, but that's really about it. Um, in, in terms of the fun factor, like I said, there's, like, two or three scenes that are kind of enjoyable. But other than that... It's just a very serviceable film. It's just existing there to really just, you know, see if there's any interest in this franchise. Um, now, I have heard that Disney believes this is a global film. And I think with that depiction, they feel this is the kind of movie where it's going to do so well over in international waters, they're only going to make the next one because... This one did well overseas, and it did pretty well in China. So if it's going to do overall overseas, then a sixth one's going to be okay to make just for the other part of the globe! And this is not the first time either! They're still doing Ice Age movies because they're doing well overseas. Uh, I'd, be, I'd be surprised to see... I'm actually really curious to see how, the, how, how this one is faring... Critic-wise, over on the other side of the globe. Um, just for curiosity's sake. So, um, I really don't have much else to say about this film. It just exists just to get people paid. Um, it just exists because they just want to see if there's anything else they can do with it, and obviously they can't. It's movie number five. Hell, even the original Plan of the Apes stopped at that number. Um, and if this is, if this was their big finish, then it went out with an okay, eh. At least I can say it ended. But if they ever do a sixth one... <sighs> take it for what it is, and, um... I got a mummy to see next. <laughs> Uh, pray that one's good.